Hello again, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for downloading this latest edition of the China History Podcast. Last week, we looked at Qing Dynasty from 1800 to 1853. It was a time of great internal suffering in China. All the greatest hits of China's sorrows were all happening simultaneously. Natural disasters, corruption on a debilitating scale, inflation, social problems, peasant discontent, and beyond all this accumulated misery, you had widespread opium addiction, rebellions in central China and in the frontier, plus foreign aggression in the form of demands for more open trade. And the Western powers, mainly Great Britain, France, and the U.S., they backed up their demands with all the firepower and weapons that the Industrial Revolution had yielded up to this point. And as bad as this time period was, the next 50 years will be no better. In fact, the entire 19th century was a 100-year-long migraine headache for China. We left off last time as the Taiping rebels left their stronghold in Yong'an and marched on Nanjing, taking Wuchang first in January of 1853. Following this, the Taiping rebel army has taken the ancient Ming capital of Nanjing in March of 1853. It is then renamed to Tianjin. Everything is Tian this and Tian that with uh, Hong Xiuquan. He was the Tian Wang, the heavenly king of the Tian Guo, or heavenly kingdom. And he is now setting the movement up in Tianjin, the heavenly capital. So I guess you could figure out what Tian means. We'll resume our sad story right here as Hong Xiuquan enters Nanjing, carried on a golden palanquin, wearing his imperial yellow robes and the crown of a Christian king. And he then takes up residence in the former Ming Palace, where Zhu Yuanzhang set himself up 500 years before. And it was here in Nanjing that the administrative and nerve center for the Taiping Tianguo, the heavenly kingdom of great peace, remained until the whole thing went down in a blaze of guts and glory in 1864. But we're in March of 1853 now, and from the time of Hong Xiuquan's nervous breakdown, or whatever it was, back in 1836, 17 years have passed. He's gone from four-time civil service exam loser to king of his own country, and son of God to boot. The country is in disarray now, and the shockwaves hitting the forbidden city were substantial. The Qing army was no more successful dealing with these Taiping rebels than they were dealing with Britain. That's how badly the army had degraded. But we'll see soon that this problem gets addressed later on. So the government is shocked and awed, and the military seems impotent to halt this force of a million rebels. So does Hong keep the momentum going and march north on Beijing to deliver the knockout punch? It's the perfect time. He's got them on the run, and things are... Sufficiently in disarray up there to the extent that he could just march right in like Li Zicheng did in 1644. Does he do this? Of course not. To Hong, this wasn't a moment to attack. So much it was a time to savor the fruits of victory and explore the benefits of being a king. So even though Hong's creed was most puritanical in almost every way, despite all this preaching and segregation of the sexes and all these rules and calls for austerity and collective wealth or collective poverty, whatever the result might be, even though he taught this game, in truth, Hong immersed himself in a world of sex and debauchery. Wherever he went, he was carried on a sedan chair. He had endless pretensions to glory and royalty, and he was like these like these African hardcore dictators of the 80s with all this pomp and majesty. He surrounds himself with concubines and female assistants. All his chief palace officials are all women. So Hong Xiuquan, the heavenly king, hangs back in Nanjing a couple months and makes all kinds of pronouncements and starts organizing all the elites and super elites. He's passing out titles and kingships like there was no tomorrow. The elites of the movement were the core group of perhaps about 20,000 who had been with Hong since the very beginning from the Guangxi days. This core group, mostly all Hakka, of course, became the top guys in the movement, and those closest to the top of the pyramid enjoyed fabulous perks, such as any member of royalty might expect. So Hong spends his time enjoying himself and formulating how the heavenly kingdom was to restore an all-Han-ruled China, free of any taint of Manchu intrusion. 
It is decided after a couple weeks or so that two expeditions will be sent to the north and to the west to bring down the Qing. So it's the spring of 1853, and we see the launch of the Taiping Northern Expedition and the Taiping Western Expedition. In short, the Northern Expedition is a complete failure. It started off good. They took Yangzhou on April 1st, 1853, and continued marching north, always gaining in numbers to swell their ranks. There was another large-scale rebellion also going on in the north that I mentioned in the last episode. This was the Nian Rebellion, and we'll get to that in a minute. The northern Taiping army and the Nian rebels made some efforts to join together to defeat their common enemy, but nothing ever came of it, and these rebellions remained independent of each other and were therefore only half as effective against the Qing armies as they could have been. By the time the Taiping army reached Tianjin, they were way, way overextended and not in good shape. The scourge of many an army, going back to ancient times, cold and hunger, took its toll on the Taiping Northern Expedition Army. They were severely beaten back, and by 1854, they are cornered in Shandong and are wiped out. The Taiping Western Expedition forces fared a little better. They left Nanjing on May 19, 1853. They took Anqing in Anhui. Then from there, they split into two groups— one of those armies took the city of Xiangtan in April of 1854. Xiangtan is in Hunan, a mere one hour away by car from Mao Zedong's birthplace of Shaoshan. About this time, the Taiping Rebellion peaks for the fortunes of Hong and his heavenly kingdom. From here on out, decay sets in that is much faster acting than the decay that hit the Qing dynasty. The fortunes of the Taiping rebels begin to slide starting around the middle of 1854. You see, while the Taiping armies are braving it out on the battlefield, things back in Nanjing were not going too well. The topmost layer of the Taiping leadership was afflicted with factionalism of the worst sort. You had all these kings who were the closest people to Hong Xiuquan. The eastern king was the most powerful of all these kings. This was Yang Xiuqing. He starts to get a little too powerful for his own good, so Hong becomes wary of him and begins to see him as a threat. The northern king was Wei Changhui, and the so-called assistant king was Shi Da Kai. Both of them also view Yang Xiuqing as a threat. There's a period of jockeying for power and maneuverings behind the scenes. On September 2nd, 1856, the northern king, Wei Changhui, bumps off the eastern king, Yang Xiuqing, with his entire family. Yang being a rival to Hong Xiuquan and all, it's assumed that he had his hand in the whole ordeal. So Yang Xiuqing is now gone, and now the two allies, Wei Changhui and Shi Da Kai, they turn on each other, and in the end, Shi Da Kai prevails. By this time, the only ones left in the inner core of the Taiping leadership were Hong, Shi Da Kai, and Hong's two brothers, Ren Da and Ren Fa. These two siblings acted as Hong's minders and handlers, and by this time, Hong was altogether unstable and irrational. No one except his concubines and his most trusted family members ever saw him. He was a total wreck. The foreigners had already given up on the Taipings as a movement that they could get behind. Once everyone saw how off-the-charts crazy Hong was and how much his version of Christianity differed from the religion they were all familiar with, they began to walk away from him. They remained neutral for the time being, but in the end were disappointed at how this Taiping Tianguo thing had turned out. Shi Da Kai was suspicious of Hong's two brothers and feared that they were colluding against him, so he takes off and heads west. And we'll see later one of the reasons the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom failed was because of all this instability at the top. No one trusted anyone, and this shakiness at the top led to the ultimate failure of the movement. The Qing government recognized their severe limitations and took stock of their situation and ineffectiveness in suppressing the Taiping rebels. They turned to a group of people in the provinces who viewed Hong Xiuquan and his Taiping rebel movement as a common enemy. The Confucian literati, gentry, and aristocrats out in the provinces were aghast at the Taiping rebels' iconoclasm against Confucian ways and traditions. The Taipings, with their screwy mixture of the Bible and Hong's visions of what China should be, were anathema to these traditional Confucianists. 
Yet a number of small militias organized to protect the interests of the conservative Confucian elites and just plain old bureaucrats, elites, and literati. They had the most to lose if the Taiping successfully took control of the central government. So these rich Confucian and conservative elements did not support the Taiping and funded all these local militias. From the ranks of these Han, traditional Confucian scholar military leaders, three names you should know. Preeminent among them was Zeng Guofan, followed by his protege, and a man we will hear a lot about in the next episode as well, Li Hongzhang. The third was Zuo Zongtang. Now this general, Zuo Zongtang, you've all heard of him perhaps. If you ever went to your local Chinese restaurant and saw the Favorite sweet and spicy Hunan dish, General Tso's chicken. This is the General Tso from whom the dish originated. Little fun fact for you. Let's look at the most important one, Zeng Guofan. Zeng was a Hunan Ren through and through, born, raised, and educated in Hunan. He was an official who served the Qing dynasty well, and was also a scholar of Confucianism and a great military strategist. When called upon by the government, he used his own connections and resources to raise an army of Hunan peasants. And this army, which became known as the Xiang Army, or Xiang Jun, became a well-trained, well-organized, and very effective fighting force that beat back the Taiping rebels repeatedly. Now, the word Xiang, first tone, is an abbreviated way to say Hunan. Every province in China has a single character that's used to abbreviate the name of the province. For example, on license plates in China, you'll see a single character plus the plate number to show in which province the car is registered. The character for Hunan was Xiang. Since Zeng Guofan was Hunanese and the peasants mostly all came from Hunan, it was simply called the Xiang Army. Although they had a bad start, the Xiang Army took back the key cities of Changsha, the Hunan capital, as well as Wuchang, Hanyang, Hanko which are the cities that make up the area known as Wuhan. He also defeated the Taiping Navy soundly. So the Xiang army breathed new life into the Qing dynasty. It was only meant to deal with matters in Hunan, but due to its smashing success, the Xiang army became the core of the newly rejuvenated Qing army. Now there's quite a bit going on in China concurrently. It's not easy to explain all this linearly because while Hong Xiuquan and his gang are down in the south doing their things, there are other major events also taking place. You had a devastating change of course of the Yellow River. It did this from time to time throughout Chinese history, and it did it again in 1855. And believe it or not, it took 15 years before Shandong province recovered from this change of course by China's sorrow, the Yellow River. I mentioned in the last podcast episode, there was also a rebellion known as the Nian Rebellion in 1851 to 1868. Let's talk about this one for a minute. This was all going on concurrent with the Taiping Rebellion. The two rebellions never joined hands to defeat their common enemy. This particular disturbance happened in the north of China. The Taiping Rebellion was a southern movement. The Nian had zero religious affiliation. They had no politics one way or another. There wasn't any one single leader. Initially, it was a conglomeration of many bands of rebels, all separate. They were initially inspired by the old White Lotus Society. They also had very few, if any, goals other than to overthrow the Qing and get rid of the Manchus. They dyed their beards red, which was the symbolic color of the Ming Dynasty. Their core member was either a poor peasant, a member of a secret society, or both. I also read that because of the uh, female infanticide that was prevalent during this time, there was a 20% shortage of girls in the north, and so a lot of these men who couldn't find wives back then just ended up joining up uh, with the uh, local Nian rebels. So this rebellion didn't have all the drama and baggage of the Taipings, but they did control vast stretches of northern China and posed no less a challenge to the Qing dynasty than did the Taipings. These guys were all about looting and pillaging. The Nian rebels, they preyed on anyone who had anything to take. As in the south, you had the development of local militias who would band together to fight these Nian whenever they might come to their village to see what wealth there might be to snatch. 
So by 1851, this movement became big enough where it caught the eye of the Qing government. And then, as I said, in 1855, the Yellow River floods like crazy and brings more misery to the region, which, of course, swells the ranks of hopeless, disaffected, and dirt-poor rebels. In 1852, these Nian really start to organize for the first time. They select from among the ranks of 18 Nian groups, Zhang Lexing. He becomes the top guy in the movement and is given the title Great Han Prince. And by 1856, he's named Lord of the Alliance. The fighters under his control only numbered about 30 to 50,000, but these are all veteran troops who were very effective and brutal when it came to fighting and rampaging all over the countryside. The battles between the Nian rebels and the Qing army were all guerrilla warfare skirmishes. The Qing sent Zheng Guofan up north to deal with them, but surprisingly, Zheng fails. So the task then falls on Zheng's protege, Li Hongzhang. Li fought a slow, steady war of attrition with the Nian. By 1868, four years after the Taipings were subdued, the Nian rebels were in utter disarray, and the top leadership of the movement was all divided. So Li Hongzhang's army was very well supplied and with the latest Western firepower, and eventually they wore the Nian down, and in April of 1868, the rebellion was officially over. So this makes a hero out of Li Hongzhang, and he is given the honorary title Grand Guardian of the Heir Apparent. So let's jump back to what's happening with the Taiping Rebellion down in the south. Let's go back to uh, April of 1859. It's been six years since Nanjing has been taken by the victorious Taiping rebels. Success has been mixed up till now. The only true success they could claim was throwing the country and the Qing government into disarray. But internal fighting and backstabbing at the highest level has caused the movement to falter. It needed a calm voice of reason to set everything back on a steady course and seize the initiative again. On April 22, 1859, Hong Rangan arrives in Nanjing. He is Hong Xiaotran's younger cousin who had not participated in the movement up till now. Hong Rangan had been living in Hong Kong all this time, heavily involved in the Christian missionary movement down there. Hong Rangan arrived in Nanjing, or Tianjin as it's called now, and he had two things on his mind. First was to educate the Taipings about true Christian faith and the real teachings of Jesus. The second thing that he had set out to do was to reach out to the foreigners more and obtain their support and recognition. Hong Rangan acted as a sort of a foreign minister for the Taiping movement. So he comes to town, the cousin of the Taiping leader, and his head is filled with all these ideas about reforming. Remember, he's been in Hong Kong all this time and had a lot of experience dealing with foreigners and studying Western ways and values up close. It's around this time in 1859, 1860, thereabouts, that Hong Xiaotran really starts to decline in health, both physically and mentally. Hong Rengan assumes the role of the Heavenly King's spokesman. Now, there were also other remaining kings to deal with, the heroic king and the loyal king. Remember, Hong Xiaotren had created several kings, north, south, east, west, assistant, heroic, loyal. So these two kings, uh, Li Xiaocheng and Chan Yucheng, they're wary of the heavenly king's family relative, and they more or less do whatever they can to prevent anything Hong Rang Gan wants to do to improve the fortunes of the movement and of China. His efforts during this time sort of earned him a place in history as one of China's first nationalist reformers. Both the communists and nationalists saw him uh, in a positive light for his sincere efforts to rescue China at a time of terrible tragedy and gloom. The Taiping are starting to gather some momentum, despite the chaos at the top of the leadership. Now they set their sights on Shanghai. The foreigners didn't want that. They've been neutral all this time, but now that commercial interests were threatened by a Taiping rebel march on Shanghai, now the foreigners decided to take sides. They sided with the Qing. Better to keep propping these guys up than risk everything they fought for, fall apart in the face of the radical Taiping rebels and their crazy leader. So, 1860, a pivotal year in the history of the Taipings. So, let's stop for a second, and we'll come back to this final phase of the Taiping Rebellion, beginning in 1860, when the foreigners join in the fray. For now, let's rewind the clock back to 1856-1860. What we have here 
is best known as the Second Opium War, but also called the Arrow War. It all actually began in 1854, 12 years after the Treaty of Nanjing had been signed that ended the First Opium War. The time had come to renegotiate the treaty. The Chinese side was completely contemptuous of the treaty because it was so one-sided from any angle you looked at it. So they had dug their heels in hard as far as honoring it, and by 1854, the British are not happy with how things are going. So when it came time to renegotiate, here's what the British wanted. One, access to the entire interior of China. If this was not acceptable, then at least total access must be given to the entire coast of Zhejiang and up the Yangtze to Nanjing. Zhejiang is the province in China that has all the plum cities like Shanghai at the very top, Ningbo, Zhoushan, Hangzhou, Wenzhou, Shaoxing, very rich pickings in this province. And even today, this is the richest or one of the richest provinces in China. Two, they wanted legalization of the opium trade. They came right out and demanded it, knowing full well how sensitive this issue was with the China government, not to mention the good Christians back in England. Three, all the irritating internal transit duties on imports had to be canceled. Four, British get to keep a full-time ambassador in Beijing. And believe it or not, of all the demands, this was the one that Qing went craziest over. And number five, uh, if all these terms weren't degrading enough to the Chinese, English had to become the official language for all treaties entered into. And the Chinese, they could scream and rant and fuss all they wanted to, but... The truth remained, these foreigners had some fearsome weapons, and if they unleashed all this power against the Qing forces, there was going to be no stopping them. And on top of all this, the Qing armies were stretched thin, trying to put down these rebellions and revolts all over the place. So there were delays and delays and hemming and hawing about the negotiations until April 8th, 1856. By this time, the British were simply itching for an excuse to launch a war to get what they wanted. So on this day, a lorcha with Hong Kong registry and flying the British flag of convenience was legally boarded by a Qing government official. The vessel, the Arrow, was suspected of the usual smuggling and whatnot. Twelve crew members were arrested, all of them Chinese, and the British make a big fuss in Guangzhou about this, and at last they have their casus belli. And this incident sparks the Arrow War, also called the Second Opium War. The first thing the British do is seize Guangzhou, Canton. This was in December 1857. The Taiping Rebellion is raging in full fury right now. So whatever happens with the British, the Qing knows they're in no position to do anything to prevent or even slow down the inevitable. Now remember, besides having to deal with the Taiping Rebellion and the British who are smashing and grabbing whatever they want, the Nian rebels are still doing their thing up north. The Yellow River is a wreck, and it's, it's a terrible time to be living in Shandong. I haven't mentioned this yet, but down in the southwest, in good old Yunnan province, there's also a very serious revolt going on down there, too. So the Qing government is in a very tight spot by all accounts. So they have their hands full, and the British know it, and they're about to let the Chinese have it. After Canton falls at the end of 1857, the British forces simply repeat the Tried and true method used last time in the First Opium War and start marching north towards the capital. The Taku Fort, or Taku Paltai, is taken. This is just south of Tianjin. So now the British are right within striking distance of Beijing. It's worth mentioning that when the British fought at the Taku Fort, it didn't go very well at first, and they had to call in the Americans to help them out. Commodore Josiah Tatnow, the skipper of the American vessel, came to the assistance of the British, and in his famous reply back to Washington, Tatnow wrote that, quote, blood was thicker than water to justify his decision to drop U.S. neutrality and help out their British cousins. The good old special relationship was just getting started. The upshot to all this was another unequal treaty that infuriated the Chinese. This time, it was the Treaty of Tianjin in 1858. The terms were, one, a British ambassador can reside in Beijing, two, Christian missionary work was protected, three, with a valid passport, one could travel anywhere they wanted in China, four, if a person did not carry a passport, they could still wander freely within 30 miles of a treaty port, five, four new treaty ports were opened along the Yangtze, in Hankou, Jiujiang, 
Nanjing, and Zhenjiang. Six, six additional treaty ports were opened up, two each in Taiwan and one each in Manchuria, Shandong, Guangdong, and Hainan. Seven, all future interior transit taxes on foreign goods were set at a flat rate of 2.5%. Eight, standard weights and measures were adopted. Nine, all official communication between Britain and China was to be in English. And ten, the character Yi, used all the time by the Chinese in official communications, was forbidden to be used anymore. Yi was the word for foreigners, and it basically meant barbarian. <laughs> then lastly, the matter of opium was addressed, and moving forward, it went like this, quote, Opium will henceforth pay 30 tails per pickle. A pickle is uh, 130 pounds. Uh, the importer will sell it only at the port. It will be carried into the interior by Chinese only, and only as Chinese property. The foreign trader will not be allowed to accompany it. So basically, opium was officially legal to export to China, but as a consolation, the British were saying that, you know, we'll uh, just give it to you at the port, and you guys can handle everything on the distribution end. This whole bill of goods, as you can imagine, didn't sit well with the emperor. I know we've been going back and forth during this time. The Xianfeng Emperor, he sat on the throne during this time. He was the son of the Daoguang Emperor. The Daoguang Emperor, of course, had to deal with the first opium war in its immediate aftermath. Now the son has his own brush with the foreign devils to deal with. The Xianfeng Emperor reigned from 1850 to 1861, so it's this emperor who truly has to be wringing his hands, wondering how did he get stuck ruling in such a tumultuous time period. Not only did he have to deal with the Second Opium War, he got the full brunt of the Taiping Rebellion plus the Nian Uprising, and part of his reign also witnessed the uprisings in Yunnan as well as a full-scale outbreak there of bubonic plague that killed millions both in India and in China. The good old days of Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong seemed like ages ago. Everything started to slide during the second half of Qianlong's reign, and now, by 1860, it had all come down to this. So this Treaty of Tianjin takes effect, and the Chinese really do not like the idea of a full-time British representative based in Beijing. They made a lot of noise about this and sat on their hands, and the British... They got infuriated, so they sent a delegation to Beijing to see what's up with that, and why is this all taking so long? Well, these guys got all roughed up, and a few of them were killed, so now it was time for the British to teach the Qing Emperor a lesson. Lord Elgin, Britain's chief negotiator, is selected to lead the punitive attack on Beijing. On October 18, 1860, the beautiful and elegant summer palace, the Yuan Ming Yuan, built by Qianlong and designed in part by Jesuit architects in one of the greatest cultural catastrophes of all time, was burned and destroyed. The Xianfeng Emperor, he flees Beijing for the safety of Manchuria. His younger brother, Prince Gong, is left in charge to deal with the aftermath. Prince Gong we'll talk more about in the next podcast. The Summer Palace was burned down and looted, and fears were that the Imperial Palace was next, so Prince Gong renegotiated with the British and reaffirmed the unequal and humiliating Treaty of Tianjin. And then to rub salt in the wound, the Emperor had to express his deep regret at what happened to the British negotiators who had been sent to the palace and got all manhandled. In addition to this, they had to pay an indemnity of 8 million taels of silver and had to agree to allow Chinese to emigrate on British ships. The British, of course, were hot for that coolie labor. The word coolie was used for Asian laborers, namely of Chinese or Indian origin. It comes from the two Chinese characters, ku and li, meaning bitter labor. In addition to all this, the British were able to get more territory in Hong Kong and were ceded the Kowloon Peninsula. The Xianfeng Emperor died shortly after this all went down and passes from this earth before his time on August 22, 1861. He died a bitter and defeated man, no doubt, and only lived to the age of 30. Next up was his son, only five years old at the time, and he becomes the Tongzhi Emperor. This boy emperor will take us only up to 1875 before he dies of smallpox at the age of 18. He's not important. It's the one who is controlling him who had all the power. And this, of course, was his mother, the most infamous 
Empress Dowager in all of China's long history, Cixi Taiho. We're going to look more at her next week. There was one other rebellion I haven't mentioned. It begins right after the death of the Xianfeng Emperor. This one was in the northwest in Xinjiang province, and this was a Muslim revolt that got real messy around 1862. This one raged till November 1873, and when this last revolt is finally put down, that's the end of it. This long nightmare for China finally came to an end. Or did it? No, it most definitely did not. Although we have what's known as the Tongzhi Restoration, China still has not woken up from this long nightmare. In the mid-1860s, after the Taipings were vanquished, and after the Nian were put down in the north, and after the humiliating Treaty of Tianjin, there was a general feeling among certain high-ups in the imperial leadership that China had to do something fast. Next week, we will look at the life of the Empress Dowager Cixi, and we will also look at this Qing Restoration, or Tongzhi Restoration, which sort of ran out of gas around 1875 or so. It seemed as if the Qing were going to make a comeback, but as we'll see, they were too committed to restoring their past glory rather than to find their place in the new modern world. And this is how it's going to be for the Qing rulers all the way up to the bitter end in 1912. So let's wind things up here and sort of look at the bitter and bloody end of the Taiping Rebellion. What were the consequences? Why did it fail? And so forth. Karl Marx said something interesting worth repeating. Like many other Europeans, he was intrigued by them at first and thought highly of them. But after he saw what they were really all about, he wrote, quote, What is original in this Chinese revolution are only its bearers. They are not conscious of any task except the change of dynasty. They have no slogans. They are an even greater scourge to the population than the old rulers. It seems their vocation is nothing else than to set against the conservative disintegration of China, its destruction in grotesque, horrifying form, without any seeds for a renaissance. As I said, after Hong Gan arrives in Nanjing and attempts to reform everything about the Taiping movement, it's decided to march on Shanghai. I mentioned the foreign powers saw no possible benefit from having these anti-opium-smoking rebels converging on the commercial center that Shanghai was fast becoming. The city had come quite far since the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842. It was now divided into a Chinese walled city, a French concession, and an international settlement administered and controlled by Great Britain. Fully one half of all the foreign trade in China was done in this city. So when it was learnt in 1861 that the Taipings were coming, all of a sudden the new five-year-old Qing emperor, he didn't sound like such a bad option. And so in cooperation with the Qing government, a volunteer corps is established. This fighting force had the job of backing up Li Hongzhang's effort with his Huai army against the Taipings. It was Frederick Townsend Ward who initially set up this force and led it until he's killed in 1863 and replaced by the more famous of the leaders, General Charles Gordon. Gordon was present when the Summer Palace was raised. He's known in history as Chinese Gordon, and of course uh, attained immortality, dying at the hands of the forces of the Mahdi in Khartoum in 1885. And Charlton Heston played Gordon in the 1966 Hollywood epic called Khartoum. This volunteer corps morphs into the ever-victorious army, as it's called, the Changsheng Jun, and it's this ever-victorious army, led by General Gordon, that plays a role in supporting the efforts of Li Hongzhang and Zheng Guofan in defeating the Taipings once and for all. It's said in the final assault on Nanjing in July of 1864, over 100,000 rebels fought to the death over a three-day period. Most of Nanjing was utterly destroyed. Hong Xiuquan, the heavenly king, had died mysteriously, of course, it said possibly by poisoning, on June 1st, 1864. His young son becomes the new king, and there was some attempt made to keep things going, but by now it was curtains for the Taiping leaders, and they were all hunted down and killed, including Hong Ren Gan, and the heroes of the day were Zheng, Li, and Zhuo. It was these three generals who were given most of the credit for 
not only defeating the Taipings, but for also breathing some life back into the Qing and helping them to hang in there a little bit longer. And, of course, Zhuo Zongtang is forever immortalized at Panda Express, Magic Walk, and 10,000 other Chinese restaurants for Zhuo Zongqi, General Zhuo's Chicken. It seems the Qing should have been a pushover to defeat. The Taiping movement had so much momentum, why didn't they succeed? There are many reasons, but chief among them was the leadership was not good. At the top, you had a crazy man surrounded by right-hand men who were suspicious of each other and didn't get along at all. And the two key military leaders were killed off early in the 1852 campaigns when they first marched on Nanjing. This was Feng Yunshan and Xiao Chaogui, the so-called Southern and Western kings, as so named by Hong Xiuquan. Losing these two key guys so early in the game was a huge blow to the movement. After these two pass from the scene, all that's left are the eastern king, Yang Xiaoqing, and the assistant king, Shi Da Kai, who also becomes the Taiping's greatest general. But these two lose faith in Hong, and of course Yang is killed in a palace coup in 1856 on Hong's orders, and Shi Da Kai, he splits from the movement later on and ends up trying to set up his own little kingdom in Sichuan province, and he ends up getting killed by Qing troops in 1863. So with his most important people gone, Hong can't rise to the occasion, and the movement hits a rough patch, and the reforms of Hong Ren Gan that might have saved them are never put into effect. Another major reason for their failure was a lack of vision and a dearth of any kind of clear objective or direction. It's as if once the Taiping army captured Nanjing, the movement ended. They sat there for a while before they decided oh, well, why not finish this whole thing and march on Beijing? Hong also failed because he couldn't take advantage of the whole countrywide anti-Manchu sentiment. He wasn't able to tap into that energy and use it to his advantage and position himself as an alternative to the Qing. And all this preaching about egalitarianism, commonwealth, and a more evenly distributed landholding system, it sounded nice, but not all the peasants bought into the idea. And after a while, the Taiping movement began to try to raise money and support for their armies from the countryside, and in no time at all, they were viewed as just another tax collector. And the Taiping rebels who crowded into Nanjing, they made themselves unwelcome at once. The devastation done to some parts of China from this Taiping rebellion of 1850-1864 were still clearly visible half a century after it ended. It's estimated... 20 to 30 million people lost their lives from the fighting and all the collateral damage that wars inflict on the populace. Half the population of Yunnan province was killed between Muslim revolts, plague, and the general chaos of the time. Over 5 million were lost in Guizhou province. The lower Yangtze region saw most of the action, and it was devastated. The loss of life was immense, and it took a lot of internal migration from Henan, Hunan, Hubei, northern Jiangsu, to fill up this region again. I mean, there was a greater loss of life in the Taiping Rebellion than in all of World War I. And remember the four treasures, the Si Ku Quan Shu from the episode two weeks ago, Qing Part 3? This was the massive work produced during the time of the uh, Qianlong Emperor. Well, let's just say there was a little cultural revolution that happened during these iconoclastic times, three of the four surviving copies were destroyed. Only one remains, and that was the actual one presented to Qianlong. The losses that were caused by the Taiping Rebellion went far beyond human life. At the start of the Taiping Rebellion in 1850, the population of China was roughly 410 million. After this period that witnessed the Taiping Rebellion, the Nian Rebellion, revolts in the southwest and Yunnan in the northwest and Xinjiang, from the Aero War and all the diseases and natural disasters, most notable the changing, of course, of the Yellow River, the population of China in 1873 was only about 350 million. When we resume next week, we'll look at the period during the Tongzhi Emperor and his wicked mother, the Empress Dowager Cixi. This era was from 1861 to 1875. 
You have the end of the Taiping Rebellion and the rise to power of Cixi. Following the Tongzhi Emperor, all we have left is his cousin Guangxu, and then Pu Yi, and we's done, baby. Pu Yi was the last emperor, the one from the Oscar-winning picture directed by Bernardo Bertolucci. So next week we'll focus on the Tongzhi Restoration, the life of Cixi Taiho and her henchmen, Prince Gong and the Princess Chun. We'll also look at the ill-fated Hundred Days Reform. Much more of Li Hongzhang and the Great Kang Yu Wei. We'll look at all this as well as the frustrating attempts to reform China in the 1870s and up to the bitter end in 1912. We also have the Sino-Japanese War, the Boxer Rebellion, and all kinds of other interesting things. China is crawling with foreigners all over the place by now, so this is so this always makes for interesting and unpredictable events. I'm not sure if I'll be able to finish off the Qing next week, but if not, we'll do a part seven, and that ought to do it. I apologize to all of you who might have found it difficult to follow the narrative today. There were so many things going on in Chinese history during this brief period in the 1850s and 60s. They're all sort of staggered, so I thought it would be better to introduce all this in the way that I did than to do five little mini podcasts in one each event. As I said, when we finish this whole China dynasty overview, we'll spend the rest of the days of this China history podcast series, however long it's fated to run, coming back again and again to focus on all the things we merely glanced at briefly over the past half year. And so, from a wonderfully sunny, hot, and gorgeous Claremont, California, with our quaint and lovely Claremont Village, home to such fine and established enterprises as Rhino Records, Walters, Viva Madrid, the Cheese Cave, and the Harvard Square Cafe. This is Laszlo Montgomery, your humble host and narrator, wishing you all a fond and friendly farewell. Join us each week, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.